Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. It has been another crazy week of Starship news, space tourism, the maiden flight of a fully reusable Spanish rocket, explosive testing at Rocket Lab, Amazon puts their Starlink killer into action, NASA prepares for double spacewalks, and much, much more. Starbase has been a little quieter over the past week, but there's still lots of exciting updates to share today. On Tuesday, Tesla nerds and SpaceX nerds joined forces as a Tesla Cybertruck was not only spotted on site, but appeared to be helping out. Here it is towing an RVAC Starship rocket engine at Starbase. I'm just going to wait for the day when Tesla make a Cybertruck commercial with the truck, well, maybe trucks, plural, towing a super heavy booster down the highway to the launch pad. Make it happen, SpaceX. Over in the high bay, Ship 31 reached full height last week. NASA Spaceflight Starbase Live captured the moment where the vehicle was lifted up and then stacked on its aft section. We are now getting a crazy number of vehicles reaching near flight readiness. Here's hoping the FAA and all the fish and wildlife people can get things moving for SpaceX to actually start launching some of these rocket ships. Ship 25 and Booster 9 have been stuck in a sort of limbo for a little while now. As you can see, alongside the high bay, Mega Bay 2 is rapidly approaching visual completion. It's now at full height, with only a small amount of external cladding still waiting to be installed. Now I think the photo of the week has to go to NASA Spaceflight's Sean Doherty, who captured this amazing sunrise photo of the full stack. You can actually buy this as a metal print, I'll leave a link in the description to the NASA Spaceflight store, and you know, I'm seriously considering buying it. Booster 9 underwent some minor testing last week, its grid fins were actuated on Tuesday. This test was later followed by actuation of the flaps of Ship 25. Underneath the stack, a new subcooler manifold was delivered to the pad, meaning that SpaceX are still using the downtime before the next launch to make repairs and upgrades to the tank farm and deluge infrastructure. Cybertruck also made another appearance at the pad, briefly driving towards the orbital launch mount's pillars, and it was then seen driving around towing the RVAC engine once again, and in fact this may well have been for a Tesla commercial or something as a camera car was seen leading the vehicle. But I still stand by my suggestion that the next booster rollout should be supplemented by Cybertrucks for the ultimate promotion. What was pretty funny about this shoot was the fact that one of the camera drones was obliterated by the engine bell. I saw this posted on X, forever Twitter in our hearts, and I thought that it was a little bit ironic that a lot of folks in the comments were talking about how expensive the drone cost and not so much the multi-million dollar Raptor engine that hit it. Hopefully it was all okay, though given that it was used for a promo shoot, this Raptor engine might not be intended for flight. What do you think? Let me know in the comment section down below, and of course, while you're down there, give a little like on the video, helps me out and all that. Anyway, after the Cybertruck departed for good, we saw the arrival of Ship 25 stand, indicating that a D-stack was imminent. Furthermore, workers placed protective covers on the ship's quick disconnect interface panel, the quick disconnect arm was then retracted, and then the ship was D-stacked. We were expecting at least one more D-stack prior to launch in order to arm the vehicle's flight termination system, but given that there's still no confirmation of a launch license or approval for launch from the environmental protection groups, that's not what this D-stack is likely for. Maybe it's just a safety precaution if SpaceX are anticipating a long wait for Flight 2. After all, it was pretty stormy at Starbase last week, and towering in the sky might not be the best place for the vehicle to be stored during inclement weather. Down at the Macy's site, Ship 29 underwent some testing. NASA spaceflight caught the beginnings of a brief cryo test, so brief, in fact, that it might have been aborted for unclear reasons. We saw a variety of launches over the past seven days, including today. Earlier this morning, SpaceX launched another trusty Falcon 9 from Vandenberg Space Launch Complex 4E, carrying 21 Starlink V2 mini satellites to Starlink Shell 7. The first stage booster used on this mission was B-1063, making its 14th flight after just a 36-day turnaround. It successfully landed on the drone ship, of course I still love you, in the Pacific Ocean. That wasn't the only Falcon launch of the week. On Thursday, we saw Starlink Group 6-21, which saw a Falcon 9 carry 22 Starlink V2 minis from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40, with its ever-growing crew access tower, to Starlink Shell 6. The first stage then made a successful recovery on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, stationed in the Atlantic Ocean, 
bringing a close to its eighth overall mission. The Starlink satellite constellation is going strong then, but Amazon, i.e. the same guys as Blue Origin who have something of a history being antagonistic towards SpaceX, began launching their broadband satellite internet constellation, Project Kuiper. On the 6th of October, Kuipersat 1 and Kuipersat 2 were launched by an Atlas V rocket due to delays with Vulcan, and these satellites will allow Amazon to demonstrate their ability to send and receive broadband signals. An interesting choice of rocket that, the Atlas V can launch up to 19 metric tons to low Earth orbit, yet the combined weight of these satellites was no more than 1.4 tons. Perhaps they didn't have a choice, the Kuipersats were originally supposed to launch on Vulcan, or perhaps they didn't want to go with someone like SpaceX because of their history, or perhaps there's multiple layers of bureaucratic red tape that made it unmanageable for Amazon to use any other launch provider, which would be impossible to pick through in a short form Space News recap video. <laughs> in the early hours of today, Ariane Space launched a Vega rocket from the French Guiana Spaceport Ensemble de Lancement Vega launch pad. The rocket carried a variety of payloads, with the primary passengers being the Theos 2 and Triton satellites. Theos 2 is an Earth observation satellite operated by Thailand, and the Triton is a meteorology satellite from Taiwan, designed to measure air sea interactions. Alongside the two primary passengers were 10 CubeSats from various customers in Spain, the Netherlands, Estonia, Luxembourg, Austria, and Belgium. This was Vega's fifth small satellite mission service launch. The only other orbital launch we saw last week was from China. On Thursday, a Long March 2D launch from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center, carrying three Yaogan 39 satellites to low Earth orbit. The Yaogan series of satellites are operated by the Chinese military and are used for reconnaissance. The days are counting down to Space Creator Day. A ton of space creators such as myself, Everyday Astronaut, Star Wars, Dennis, Shadow Zone, Space Explorer Whitney, and a bunch of others are all going to be at the Technik Museum in Speyer, Germany, on the 21st of October, and you should too. I'll link Space Creator Day's website in the description so you can check out the full information. I'm also using this announcement to say that next Monday I will therefore be in Germany, so I won't be able to make a Space This Week episode. Maybe I'll be able to put a suitable replacement video together instead, but uh, consider that a big TBC. <laughs> I have a couple of sub-orbital launches to cover now. On Friday, Virgin Galactic operated their Galactic 04 commercial crewed spaceflight, carrying three private passengers and three Virgin Galactic employees. Among the tourists was Namira Salim, who has since now become the first person from Pakistan to fly to space. The spacecraft, VSS Unity, dropped from its carrier aircraft before blasting to an altitude just below the Kármán line, reaching an apogee of 87.4 kilometers. It then made a successful glide back down to Spaceport America in New Mexico. This was Virgin Galactic's fifth successful flight in just as many months. The other suborbital launch we saw was the maiden flight of the Spanish rocket Mira 1, a one-stage suborbital rocket that its designers hope will eventually serve as the first recoverable launch vehicle in Europe and will be used for research like sounding rockets are. <laughs> The launch took place on Saturday, and the footage, as you can see, doesn't really show a whole lot, but the rocket reached an apogee of 47 kilometers, short of the originally planned apogee of 80 kilometers, but its operators still considered the flight as a success as the rocket reached max Q and re-entered. On board was a Belgian microgravity research payload. Rocket Lab continued with their development of Neutron last week. They've been putting a Neutron second stage prototype tank through its paces. On Wednesday, they released this time lapse of the tank undergoing cryogenic testing, filling the tank with liquid nitrogen and pressurizing it to expected flight pressures, and it held up well. Of course, in the space industry, it's fairly standard to also test to failure, to highlight any weak points and to establish safety tolerances. And that's exactly what Rocket Lab did next. They released this video of the tank's destruction, along with the caption that the test tanks are tested far beyond operating pressures and that this test provided them with a wealth of data. So hopefully everything met and possibly even exceeded expectations. This TikTok started making the rounds on the internet over the weekend, so I thought I'd just include it here. Sorry that it loops, but it is a bit of a short clip. As you can see, it depicts a crane appearing to drop a historic Saturn 1B rocket. The footage is sped up, so it does look worse than reality. And one thing to bear in mind is that this, while sad, isn't really a huge disaster. The rocket wasn't being moved, it was being demolished, as it had deteriorated beyond repair and was therefore being torn down by demolition crews. At the end of the day, rockets weren't meant to sit in the elements for 50 plus years. 
Take note, please, fish people. <laughs> After settling in on the International Space Station, the Expedition 70 crew is currently gearing up for a pair of spacewalks scheduled for this month. On the 12th of October, NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara and ESA astronaut Andreas Morgensen will join forces and make their way out through the station's Quest airlock. Their spacewalk's objective will be to include the replacement of a high-definition camera on the station's port truss and perform various maintenance tasks in preparation for upcoming spacewalks to upgrade the station's alpha magnetic spectrometer. In addition to these tasks, there is an intriguing experiment planned for this spacewalk, where the astronauts will navigate the exterior of the station to gather samples from the surface of its modules. These samples will later be brought back to Earth for analysis to determine if microorganisms are released and can survive the harsh conditions outside the station. Microorganisms like bacteria and fungi have a history of coexisting with humans in our immediate vicinity. This makes it imperative for researchers to examine the microorganisms that might accompany crew members into space. The samples for this study will be gathered in the vicinity of life support system vents, and the objective here is to determine whether the spacecraft itself releases microorganisms, quantify the extent of the release, and map out the potential distances that they may have travelled. Looking ahead to the 20th of October, there is another spacewalk scheduled. This time, Laurel O'Hara will venture outside the station accompanied by NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbilly. Their mission involves the removal of a malfunctioning electronics box, referred to as a radio frequency group, from a communication antenna situated on the station's starboard truss. Additionally, they'll be replacing one of the 12 trundle-bearing assemblies on the port truss solar alpha rotary joint. This particular assembly had recently experienced a temporary stall before resuming normal functions. These trundle-bearing assemblies are vital in ensuring the station's solar arrays accurately track the movement of the sun as the station orbits the Earth. This spacewalk will mark Jasmine's first foray into the realm of extravehicular activities, while Laurel, with this mission, will notch up her second spacewalk. Over in Matt Play's KSP land, last week I decided to dive into parts mods in Kerbal Space Program 1, after reaching a point where I feel like there's not really much for me to do in Kerbal Space Program 2 right now. I decided to test the waters gradually by constructing a multiple launch colony on the surface of the MUN using the amazing Planetary Base Systems mod. If that sounds like an interesting watch to you, then click the card on screen that'll take you there, and I gotta give a big thanks to the names on screen as well who help support what I do here by subscribing to my Patreon page or my YouTube members program. Program. Your continued support is so greatly appreciated. But enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and I won't see you next week because I'm in Germany. Sorry, but I'll see you when I see you.